Hi, my name is Nicola Jennings. I'm director of Colnagi Foundation. Welcome to Colnagi Foundation Lates, talks with interesting people about new art exhibitions, publications and events in the UK and around the world. Today, I'm delighted to welcome Joel Kramer, the digital director of the Kramer Collection, a collection of some 80 wonderful Dutch and Flemish old master paintings from the 17th century, founded by George and Alona Kramer, his father and stepmother. Joel spent seven years at Google and is also the co-founder of the Kramer Museum, a digital museum that he created and launched a few years ago, which was designed to be viewed on a VR headset, but you can also view through an, an augmented reality app on your telephone. Before Joel and I start talking, I'm going to show you a little clip about the Kramer Museum. And I think you'll understand from that why the museum has won several VR awards over the past couple of years. Joel, perhaps you could give us a history of this whole project. Uh, well, first of all, thank you for having me. First and foremost, the, the Kramer collection is the collection. So it's, uh, it's a collection of currently 83 old master paintings from the 17th century in uh, the Netherlands and uh, Flanders, Flemish and, and Dutch art. And the Kramer Museum is, uh, is a digital museum that started as an exclusive VR museum, virtual reality museum and has since uh, grown to be more of a digital museum because it's also accessible uh, on mobile devices, iPads, iPhones, etc. And the Kramer Museum houses a big part of our collection, 74 works in an architecturally designed space, uh, but it's, it's, it only exists in the digital world. So when did you get excited about painting? I started always thinking and working from a digital angle. So I got involved in the first website, in the second website, at Google, in the Google Art Project. I was the first one who had used Google Google's Maps technology, which is a, a zoom technology, because you know I always wanted to be able to, to see detail in the paintings and to zoom in into details. And that was only at the time being done for clothing in the fashion industry. So I was the first one who used Google Maps technology on anything else than, than a than an earth map. Obviously now it's been standardized, but but we were we were there first. I literally hacked it together with a friend of mine who was a, a product engineer. I think in, in, in doing all these digital projects, I have been fortunate, of course, to have the opportunity to, to see paintings naked, out of the frame, without glass, you know, holding holding a little panel by Rembrandt. And, and really- seeing the surface. Exactly, and sometimes yeah, just yeah. standing in front of it for, you know, 30, 40 minutes. So at what point did the idea of the digital museum come? I think the third or fourth painting, or maybe the fifth, my parents bought turned out to be an actual Rembrandt. That's a significant rediscovery of one of the world's most famous artists. And everyone wants to have that painting to exhibit it in their museum, their shows. And so our loan program was off to a flying start. Art, they made, very quickly made the decision, my parents, to, to say, well, you know what, this art cannot just be ours and, and hang at home. This is some of Holland's 
most treasured export product and it should be shared with as many people as possible. Doing an offline loan program is one thing, but then let's assume you do two, maybe three shows a year, which is pushing it. Now we have 83 pieces. They're traveling all over the world, never really as a collection as a whole. So you never get to tell the whole story behind the collection, but digital for us has always been a way to try and reach really as many people as we can because it has such a scalable element. The issue, of course, is what are you offering people? You have to have a really interesting, fascinating visual story for it to go viral or for people to, to come to your website over the Rijksmuseum, the National Portrait Gallery, all the fantastic museums there are all over the world. How do we make it interesting? Sure, Zoom is, is a great way to discover paintings, but it's still flat, it's still 2D, it's not in a museum setting. It's, some of these paintings are two meters high and three meters wide. So every time I see them in real life, I, I get this wow effect because it's just so much more powerful in real life. Digital does not replace that will never replace that. But you can try and approach that feeling, but you need more than just a flat website or a mobile app. And so I was no longer with Google, but I do keep a close ear to the ground in terms of the tech developments that are happening and, and virtual reality was becoming a consumer product. Google's doing it, Samsung was doing it, HTC was doing it, Facebook had just bought a Kickstarter project called Oculus, and we're just releasing their new model of headset. And all of a sudden, for a few hundred to a few thousand euros, you could have your virtual reality experience. That's sort of the, the path to, to the VR museum, because we have a lot of information, essays, texts, imagery, also on the website, but it was never a museum-worthy experience. And I think that's the switch we made. And because the virtual reality market, the hardware market was not growing as fast as we could, but we had this fantastic experience and mobile devices were getting more and more powerful and AR, which is augmented reality capable. We decided to make a, let's say a gamified version of our museum, which means you can still in 3D have the museum experience. Uh, you navigate it um, with thumb controls like a joystick and um, there's an AR um, capability, which if you toggle that switch, it's like a magic window. So anywhere you point your phone through the screen of your phone, you're looking into the museum. What's the reaction been amongst different audiences? When we launched, we launched it with a group of friends and peers from the art world. And I would say an overwhelming 95 to maybe a hundred percent was incredibly positively surprised about what we had done. The ex-director of the Rags Museum took off his headset and said, you know, I've seen quite some stuff. So I was quite skeptical, but you're really onto something here. This has really been done extremely well. I think the architectural design of the building creates a lot of oomph. So altogether, it just works. This was in October, 2017. Then we have the tech world, which basically just loves that this technology has spread into the cultural world. And then you have, let's say, adults and, and children. Adults are amazed because it's very often the first time they're doing virtual reality. I make them turn around and look around because very often they don't understand the 360 element. And I say, and you can look up as well. And then they see the, the dome, the sphere, and the, the quote by Rembrandt. And then they start the adventure of going into the galleries. And children are very different. You don't have to give them. They just claw the remote control out of your hands and they're off to the races. If they're in the experience for 10, 15, maybe 20 minutes, 80% of that time, they will be playing around with the laser beam coming out of the remote control, you know, seeing if they can fall off the, the bridges or the edges of the bridges. But they do spend some time looking at the holograms in the museum of my parents, uh, you know, walking through paintings, because these are obviously all things that they, they can't do when they go to a museum. So that's where the gamified element came from. I'm not talking about making an art experience that teaches them nothing about Rembrandt or any other painter, but I think that's the way forward to capture the future generation. I visited a school in the Bronx. They would live a bus ride away from the Met or the MoMA or the Frick. And they had never seen Rembrandt, they had never heard of Rembrandt, let alone you know, the other painter. And that really gave me a feeling and an appreciation of the potential of this technology. So you think that by making it playful, by giving them other ways in, that that sort of begins to open them up to make them more receptive to more information about the painting, beginning to get them looking at the painting in new ways. But particularly the, the, the latter. If you stand in front of that painting for 20 minutes, 
you start seeing more and more things. If you can explain the process and the idea behind the painting and not only the, the biblical stories, but how they had to make their own paint, that is a way for children to learn about art. Yeah, yeah it's the paradox of digital, I guess, is that on the one hand, you're not physically seeing the object, but on the other hand, the technology gives you the opportunity for a close looking and of really getting right into the materiality of something. I came to understand this with the project to make huge macro photos of the Ghent altarpiece. And it's extraordinary. You know, you go on that website and you can get into those Van Eyck details in a way that you could never do, you know, unless you're a, a conservator, you would never see it that close. It's very much a cliche, but the perfect example is obviously the Mona Lisa. 99.999% of the population that visits the Louvre will never be able to see the Mona Lisa the way she should be seen, which is really up close. And, and that goes for a lot, if not m most paintings. And underneath all those fabulous paintings are different angles, different studies, different objects that no one sees. And with the new technologies like infrared cameras, x-ray photography, and, and also ways to show this through, for instance, augmented reality through a, a mobile phone app, you can really peel away those layers virtually speaking, <laughs> and see behind the painting and, and what made that painting what it is. Let's move on to a few of the paintings you love. I mean, you've talked a little bit about the Rembrandt, but there are also a number of, of other Rembrandts in your collection. These are original copper etch plates by Rembrandt. First of all, the, the process and the idea behind copper etch plates, it all has to do with printmaking and solving the problem of, you know, making more money, to be quite frank, because, you know, how do I sell the same thing uh, over and over again? So thinking scalable. And then there is the, the skill of etching because all these etches are created in mirror so that once you print them, you get the right result. If you go onto our website and you really zoom in, you can see that dark and light and then the figures and within the figures, the heads and the hands and the, the faces, you know, open eyes versus sleeping and candlelight and every scratch in that little copper edge plate has meaning, has a function. This is real skill. That's interesting because usually when you go to a museum, you'd, you'd see the prints more often than the etch plates themselves. There are a lot more prints than there, there are. I think, if I'm not mistaken, there are around 80 original etch plates left across the world. Uh, so that the fact that we as a private collection have three of them is, is pretty unique. And what about the paintings by his followers like Govert Flink? This is a, a shepherdess. It's painted beautifully with very soft colors, lots of detail in how she is positioned, how she looks. So it's, it's, it's a really, really beautiful painting. Yeah, take it down. The first thing I would say is that is smaller than my iPhone and it is painted so incredibly fine. It's, it's, a, it's effectively a miniature. Yeah, he was a real fine schilder, which is translated loosely to fine painter. It's incredibly delicate, but the brushes that he must have used are probably like two, three hairs. And there's so much detail in there. And I, I do love this Ferdinand bowl. That is the opposite, by the way. That's one of the largest yes, paintings. Huge. If I'm not mistaken, that's that's two meters high. And you also have a very beautiful uh, Michel Swirtz. Michel Swirtz, yeah. It's, <laughs> Fabulous um, painter. This guy is not very well known, but if you see some of the work that he did in his portraits, it's almost photorealistic. It's unbelievable what, what, what they can do. And, and what's interesting, I think, about Our Sphere, is The Girl with the Pearl Earring by Vermeer and Our Sphere. We're actually hung opposite each other for years. This is in the Mauritz House in The Hague. The first painting you saw on, on one wall was Our Sphere. And she's just really beautiful. She's a maidservant, so you, you have empathy for her. And then you turn around and you see immediately this incredibly powerful painting by Vermeer. It's a girl with the pearl earring with those amazing colors. And, and if you see them side by side, with a, which again, digitally, you can tell a story about that. Uh, there's a lot of similarities between the two. But the Vermeer was painted after the, the Sverts. Absolutely. Finally, I wanted to ask you about the Utrecht Caravagisti, Honthorst, Tebruchen and Baburen. The Utrecht Caravagisti. First of all, Caravaggio was a, a thug. <laughs> he was a bad boy. That has a lot of story power, of course. But then he was incredibly brilliant in the way he depicted real life, everyday people. And here are these three boys, I should say, from 
Utrecht. Imagine going to Italy and you don't have your iPhone with Google to look up a hotel or anything. You're just going there in the hope that you'll land a position somewhere to, to study painting. And so this art. is in about 1610, something like that. It's, it's a long time ago anyway. Yeah. And, and these three Utrecht painters, so Babure, Hondhorst and Ter Brugge, grow out to be the Dutch stars of Italy. And then they come back and they bring this whole school back to, to Dutch painting. And we have uh, two incredible Hondhorst. One you see here, which is St. Peter Penitent, but also Mr. Ter Brugge. Yeah, it's incredible. Have you got a painting by Baburin yet? No, we do not. And yes, it is obviously, you know, to complete that, let's say, trilogy, that's a big dream. We are looking for museum quality pieces. That's something that's still high on the list. Well, I think what you're doing is very exciting and I look forward to seeing what you do with it next. Absolutely. Well, th thank you. And yes, there is a lot in the pipeline. So hopefully we can uh, revisit this conversation soon and uh, I can tell you some updates.